All right. Well, today's scripture comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Uh, we're going to read it in the ESV. We invite you to find the scripture uh, in, in the Pew Bibles, which uh, should be ESVs. Uh, you can obviously look it up in your phone or uh, if you brought your own Bible. Uh, and we're going to do an alternate reading, uh, which means that I'll read the first verse, and we will all respond with the verse after that. We'll go back and forth until the end. And so uh, we invite you to stand as able for the reading of God's word. Again, it's Romans 8, 31 through 39. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word for us today. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, friends, uh, <clears throat> the other day I was uh, uh, sending the announcements and the, the sermon information uh, to the person who makes it, and he sent me an email back saying, uh, Pastor Steve, for several weeks uh, we've been saying metanoia, the conclusion. It's like, I don't think you know what that word means, the conclusion. <laughs> and I was like, oh, actually, this week, it so happens is actually the final week of the conclusion. I promise, maybe, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and uh, so today, uh, you know, I, I was telling the, the praise team, and uh, Jay Yoon said in his own words, uh, <laughs> I said, you know, I don't want to hype up the sermon too much, but I, I, I think that in some ways today might be the most important sermon uh, in the series. And so Jae Yoon uh, translated as <laughs> uh, that today's sermon will be spicy. I guess that means good. I, I don't know. Spicy sometimes can be bad, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. At least it'll wake you up, right? That's the hope. <laughs> but today's message um, is called Never Let You Go. And what I want to talk to you guys about today um, as, as I've been trying to describe this entire year, I've been trying to describe to you what kingdoms are. And for us to understand how we actually change, how we become the people that God wants us to be, we need to understand that hopefully, maybe, um, you have some understanding of that. But if you don't, if you still don't know what a kingdom is, uh, I, I, so, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to say is the kingdom of God is where you go after you die. Yes, it is. But it's not just that. A kingdom is an environment. It's not just an individual state. I know that's sometimes what we mean. You know, we talk about salvation as if it's just an individual exercise. Right? It's just something in your heart. You know, it's like, like some kind of, uh, uh, you know, free pass <laughs> to get into Disneyland, right? To get into heaven after you die, right? But the kingdom means more than that. And the way that I want to describe ki kingdom today is that is, it is an environment. And for many of us, we need the right environment to grow. And so what we've been trying to tell you this entire year is that Jesus' primary message Right? Jesus' primary message is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the heavens, is available to you. His words are, literally in the Greek, it is at hand, or it has arrived. It's here. It's here. You can have it. He preached that to people who were sinful, to the most uh, unlikely people. What people thought is that this kind of thing would only be available to people who cleaned up their lives, who lived morally upright. And what Jesus did was he flipped this upside down. He said, you don't have to come up to heaven. 
Heaven has come down to you, right? You don't have to climb the ladder to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is being made available to you. All you have to do, all you have to do is receive that. I know we've used the word belief, and I think that's true. But there's kind of a surrender in receiving, right? There's kind of this way where we have to believe, but in some ways we got to ingest this truth that the kingdom of God is here for you. And so then the message is then, brothers and sisters, what we've been trying to convince you is you don't change and become good and then enter the kingdom. You enter the kingdom and then you become good. Does that make sense? Right? You, you, you don't change and then enter the kingdom. You enter the kingdom and then you change. Does that make sense? Yeah, that is the gospel. That is radical. Right? Because all along what religion has taught is that you do good things. You, you clean up your life. You become a moral person. You stop sinning. You, you do the appropriate sacrifices. You, you, you serve in the right way. And then you get the reward. Right? And that is Judaism. So if that is all that Jesus was promising, is just another form of that, then we didn't, don't need Jesus at all. Does that make sense? If you can do it on your own, if you can clean up your life, then we don't need Jesus. That's why this is so radical. And so what we are describing then, what the kingdom of God is, is the right environment for you to grow. Because what we know is that for the Israelites and for many people, and you probably experienced that, this, is that we aren't able to grow. We aren't able to be like Jesus. We aren't able to have the peace and love and the blessings that God wants for us on our own. We've tried. We've tried over and over. But the problem is, is that you're not in the right kingdom. And the, 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 again, we get swirly about that word, so I'm just going to use the word environment. We don't have the right environment to grow. So uh, a place that I like to go to sometimes is the Matai Botanical Gardens. Has anyone ever been there? Um, it, it's, it's really nice. Uh, they used to charge you to go in, but now you just have to pay for parking and it's absolutely free to go in. It's a nice place to go when it's cold, uh, because there's an indoor greenhouse. They also have gardens outside, but so, you know, maybe still a little on the chilly side, hopefully. <laughs> Knock on wood, spring is finally here, you can go outside. But, uh, I like to go into the greenhouse. Uh, and walk around. A lot of you guys know I like to go to parks and walk around. And when I can't do that, you know, sometimes I go to the botanical gardens and they have these beautiful trees and flowers. And they even have like a desert room where they have like all kinds of cactuses. Cacti? Is that the plural of cactuses? <laughs> I think it's cacti. Uh, that's fun to say, cacti. <laughs> uh, they, they've got like all kinds of different things. And what you learn in the greenhouse is that... Um, Different plants need different kind of environments to grow. And so when you go into the desert room, it's nice and dry. And it's actually kind of cool in there, but it's a little bit different. There's like kind of a tropical room too. And so it's pretty cool. I don't know how they do this, uh, but they kind of temperature regulate the different areas of this greenhouse. Right? So there's like three distinct areas. One is very wet and humid. One is kind of warm, but it's not that wet. And then one is kind of cool and dry. Right? So what would happen if you took the, the desert succulents, the cacti, and you put it in the rainforest area? What would happen? I actually don't know. I'm not a botanist. <laughs> I'm guessing, though, that the cacti would not grow as well. Right? Maybe, you know, the thing with cactuses is that they're supposed to um, be very resilient. They, they can endure anything. That's actually not true. Because uh, one of my friends uh, kind of knew that I was like, uh, you know, somebody who didn't have like a lot of discipline or routine, and they wanted to buy me a gift, so they bought me a cactus. But what it was, was it was a semi-succulent. You know what that means? It's like it's kind of a cactus. Right? Cactuses need very, very little water, but this was like semi-cactus. So it needed very, very little water. And you know what? 
They, they gave that gift to me because they're like, uh, Steve, I wasn't Pastor Steve back then. This is in college. <laughs> they're like, Steve, I wanted to get you a plant, but I was worried that you wouldn't water it and you would kill it. So I got you a, a semi-succulent, right? Because you don't have to water it much. And guess what? I killed it. <laughs> but I didn't kill it in the way that you think. You know how I killed it? I watered it too much. I watered it too much. I didn't give it the right environment. And probably, <laughs> I don't know if you guys are going to think this is kind of gross, but I think my room was too moist. I don't give too much thought to that. <laughs> Little gross, right? <laughs> you know, college boys, we have like moist socks and stuff, right? <laughs> I don't know, it was a moist environment, it was gross, right? But the cactus died because it didn't have the right environment. It didn't have the right environment to grow. And I think this is what happens for many Christians, for many people. We don't have the right environment to grow because we are not in the right kingdom. So kingdom, I think, in many ways, the environment that you are in is destiny. So I just want to use another quick example of this. Your environment is your destiny. I know in this world, we like to think that where you end up is because of your individual actions, right? That, that, that you know, bad people go to jail, good people don't. But when you actually look at statistics of people who end up in jail, what you find is that they have very common characteristics. They come from a very common socioeconomic background. You know, they're, they're probably, you know, they're a little poorer, right? Um, they live in certain environments, you know, maybe in, in an urban environment. I don't know all the stuff about, you know, prison statistics, but I, I heard someone say once, uh, who was a prison chaplain, um, he said that from all my time of working in prisons, what I've found is that our, our prisons are full of people who don't have fathers or who have not really been parented, perhaps in the most loving way. Our prisons are full of the fatherless. So brothers and sisters, in many ways, you know, there are people who grow up in certain environments, and it shapes their destiny. It shapes who they become. I know, brothers and sisters, there's exceptions to all of this, right? But more often than we like to admit, in America, where it's all about, you know, land of the free, and you have all these opportunities, right? But brothers and sisters, let's be honest. A lot of us are a product of our environments, aren't we? You know, there's many people who end up successful because you are in an environment that has set you up for that success. And brothers and sisters, that is culture, that is nurture, that is the people around you. If you grow up in a loving environment where you feel supported, in many ways your prospects will be better than those who don't. Does that make sense? Yeah? Brothers and sisters, so is there an environment then that for many of us has not been conducive for us to grow in love in Christ? This is what I want to try to argue to you. I want to try to convince you. There are truths in this passage. This is a passage that, that uh, is very, very famous. Uh, it's one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. Um, some people call it, uh, you know, sort of, uh, Paul's masterpiece. He, he wrote this great poem about love, and it's something that we celebrate. And brothers and sisters, I want us to think, is this the environment we live in, believing this poem about love? Do you really believe it, not just here, but in your bones, in your nervous system? Brothers and sisters, uh, uh, let, let me just use this last example of environment. Have you ever felt like completely safe in your environment? Maybe it's like home for you. You know, there's some people who just feel very, very comfortable at home. Home is home. You know, you've got like a nice snuggly blanket, you know, and maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you guys have a dog, your dog will come and curl up next to you, you know. Your, your, your house smells a certain way. You know where everything is. You just feel safe, right? Now, have you ever been in an environment where you didn't feel safe? I don't know. Maybe you're somewhere in the inner city. I think this is a little bit of a stereotype. But, you know, maybe you're in, in like, like, I don't know, you hear police sirens. <laughs> you look around and it's really dark. You don't know where you are. 
you know, and, and, and you just feel unsafe, right? Do you know that feeling, that feeling in your body of feeling unsafe? Do you know that in your mind, in your heart, what that feels like? Yeah? Brothers and sisters, if you know that, then you are starting to understand what we mean by kingdom as a felt reality. We're not just talking about a physical place. We are talking about a felt reality. Do you feel, not just with your emotions, but with everything, are you safe? Are you loved? That's a certain kind of kingdom, a certain kind of environment, right? If you don't feel safe, if you feel anxious and nervous and uncertain, that's another kind of environment, right? And I mean, you know, which environment would you prefer? <laughs> which environment is more conducive to growth, right? And so, brothers and sisters, let's take a look at this passage. And, and again, with that mind to say, is this my kingdom? Is this where I live? Is this what I actually feel in my bones and in my nervous system? All right, so let's take a look. Uh, Romans eight thirty one and on. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So this idea, brothers and sisters, uh, that we were talking about last week was this idea that God works for our good in all things. How do we know that? What is our proof of that? Our proof is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ, we live in a differently shaped universe. We live in a universe where God is for us. God is on our side. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So what Jesus is, is a symbol in many ways. Don't get too carried away with this. Jesus actually did live and Jesus actually did sacrifice himself, right? But the symbol is this. Jesus is the most precious thing to God because Jesus is God's only born son, only begotten son, as it says in John 3, 16, right? Um, I, this is a very famous passage, right? But the most famous verse in all of scripture, I think I can say uh, with some uh, degree of confidence here, is John 3, 16, which is what? Anyone feel so bold? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? or only begotten son, as it says in, in the, the King James Version. So whoever believes in him shall not die, but have life everlasting, right? That's John 3.16. I know we all have different versions that we, read, that we memorized. But that's the idea. For God so loved the world. This is how he loved the world. By giving the most precious thing, the most precious thing, his son. He didn't just say, I love you, just, just bank on that. He gave his most precious gift, his very son. And so this is Paul's point. If God gave us his son, he, he, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, then how could you not believe that he's not on your side? I mean, was that a double negative? How could you not believe that he's on your side? Right? Like that's the proof that we need. He gave you the most precious thing. So wouldn't he also give you other good things, right? Brothers and sisters, this is meant to be something that changes your environment, that changes the way that you look at this world. You do not live in an impersonal world. This is one of the great lies. And even for Christians, even for people who say they believe in Jesus, you go to church every week. You still live in the same universe as everyone else. And what kind of universe is that? So years and years ago, there were uh, different philosophies going around. One of the philosophies was Epicureanism. And what this philosophy is about is basically where we all live now. It wasn't always this way, but it's basically whatever you see 
is whatever you get. That's it. That's it. When you die, you die. That's it. You're just matter. You're just dust. And then you're gone. There's no afterlife. There's no spiritual realities. It's just stuff. That's it. And that's where many of us live today. This is the universe. This is the environment that we grow up in. Some people call this the secular worldview, right? Uh, or many people say that even if you believe in Jesus, still in your bones, in your DNA, in your nervous system, you behave as if there is no God, as if in this world all we have is material stuff. This is it. This is all you get. And once you die, you're dead. You don't feel anything. There's no afterlife. You're just stuff. You're just dust. And if someone just takes your ashes, and, that's it. You're gone. No more you. Right? Brothers and sisters, what is the implications of this worldview? You know what I think this, <laughs> the implications of this worldview is? Is that 20% of all American adults have some kind of diagnosable anxiety disorder. It's an epidemic. I know I've been talking about this before, but I'm not even just talking about people who have anxiety. I'm talking about people who have a clinical anxiety disorder, mental illness, right? So many of us are in this world and we're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, something bad can happen to me at any moment. What is that? That's the worldview we live in. Right? That any moment something bad could happen. Right? That, that, you know, I don't want to play on your fears, but you can probably imagine what those things are. Sickness, natural disaster, you know, terrorism, whatever the, the case may be. Right? We live in a world where we are defined by fear. Because at the bottom of this world, there is nothing to hold you. You're not held. It's just random. This world is just stuff colliding into each other, just particles colliding into each other. And sometimes the particles get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they can crush you. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's the shaped world that many of us live in. And brothers and sisters, can you understand what that is doing to us? How we have become such a fearful people. And if that is in your environment, then what should you live for? This is what most people live for, to protect themselves. You build your life to protect yourself, right? One of the fears that people have is that if you follow God, that God's going to send you to Africa, <laughs> you know, which, which I think is ridiculous because God knows that we need you here, okay? Maybe he will send you to Africa, but so many of us are like, well, but, but, but if I surrender my life, then... You know, maybe God will make me a missionary in some country I don't want to go to. Brothers and sisters, why do we have that fear? Because then we won't get to live the lives that we want to live here. Which is about what? It's about making money, for sure. But for what? Let's take it to its natural conclusion. What is that going to get you? Well, get me more stuff. But for what? What is at the bottom of what is driving all of us? I think it is this kingdom that you live in, and it is a kingdom that is random and fearful, and you should be afraid. And so we live to accumulate stuff, to make money, so that you can live in a better neighborhood where there's not lots of crime, right? So you can build a big enough house with a security system and a security camera so no one comes and steals your Amazon packages, right? So we can have a, 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 an electrified fence around us. I don't know what your fantasy is. It's going to be so tall, right? Or for this country to build a big enough wall to keep out all the terrorists, right? Brothers and sisters, I don't mean to get political, but do you see at the bottom of all of this is fear? It's fear. It's the shaped universe that we live in, right? It's a universe where God is not for you. God's like, good luck. <laughs> I'll see you when you die. I'll see you when you die. And the problem with that is you have no help for life. You have no one on your side for life. And you feel that in your bones. You feel that in your DNA. This is not meant to be a moral test, brothers and sisters. 
right? What Jesus is trying to say is for each and every one of you, this is available to you, a new way of life. You don't need to achieve this. Sometimes I preach this way and then people feel guilty for feel, feeling anxious. What I'm telling you is you shouldn't feel guilty for being anxious. You should say to yourself, well, of course I feel anxious. How could you not feel anxious when you live in this world? It's inevitable, right? Your pastor has an anxiety disorder. It's called panic disorder. You know, I've shared this the past few weeks. I, I have panic attacks. And it's something that I've been learning to overcome. But I only share this just to let you know, you are not alone. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make you bad. It's just the world we live in. Does that make sense? And so what Jesus is offering you is a different kind of world a different kind of universe that you can live in now and forever. And at the bottom of this universe is not nothing like it is in the secular universe. At the bottom of this universe is a God who loves you, who sent his son to die for you, and is holding you. So brothers and sisters, let, let, let's just keep on reading this because this is so good. Um, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who has the right hand of, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Some of the language of this is a little Christian-y, so I wanted to look at uh, the message version of this same passage, 33 and 34. And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Right? So one of the things that makes us feel uncertain in this world is that there's other people here. <laughs> and they may be against you. They may be accusing you. They may be working against your good, trying to harm you. And, and what, what Paul is saying is that if all of this stuff is true, the kind of universe that you live in, the kind of reality that God wants to give you is one where you have God on your side. That's where we started, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer to that is no one. And so this idea that we need to feel bad, you know, that we're condemned, there's something wrong with us. When you come into God's universe, what you find out is that not because of what you've done, not because of your behavior, but simply because of God's love, you are absolutely loved and accepted by God. There's nothing conde to condemn you. There's nothing to feel bad about anymore. God's on your side. And not only that, it says the one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. What it says in the Greek is he's interceding for us. He, he's, he's arguing for you. He's praying for you. He's working for you. He's on your side. Jesus is on your side. That's the universe we live in. But Pastor Steve, I, I, I sin. I, 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 I'm so often not doing the right things. You think he didn't know that? Do you think any of that surprises God? Remember, we already tried the way of trying to do everything right, and then you're on God's side, and that didn't work. So God did something radical. He said, you're already on my side. Screw-ups and all, you're already on my side. Now, make no mistake, I want to make you better, right? I, I, I love you so much that everyone can come to me. But once you come to me, now you can get better. Because that's why Jesus is on your side. He's interceding for you. He's working for you. He's saying, come on, you can do this, right? And he's working all things for your good. You don't have to do it on your own. Right? So many of us, we stop at that. We, we like the part that's all about God's love for us. Like, oh, you know, God's on our side no matter what. You know, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> but this is the thing, brothers and sisters. God loves you so much that he wants to change you. But you have to get the order right. You're already accepted, and then you can change. Kingdom first, and then you can change. Kingdom first, right? And then you can actually live this righteous and holy life that God wants for you. Does that make sense? 
You got to get the order straight, but you got to know that the reason why you are in this kingdom is now you can start living like his son. Now you can start living a holy life, which is, I don't mean, you know, a life where you're judging other people, not a holier than thou life, but a life where you understand the only reason why you're there is because of God's love. You don't deserve that. None of us are worthy of that. And so you treat people different, right? But you know that God is on your side. He's working for you, right? And so then it goes on to say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So we were talking about in, in that uh, song that we sang, uh, I described this song last week and we got to sing it today. The, there's another in the fire, right? So that whole idea was there's another in the fire, right, who's keeping you from get, getting burned, who's holding back the seas. There's another with you, right? And this is the universe that we live in now. It's a universe where you're not alone. I think this is one of the main reasons why we go through so much anxiety and depression, because we feel so dang alone. We feel so alone. And so much of, of where this culture is going is that, um, you know, we, we, <laughs> we don't really need people for stuff anymore. You know, you don't need to go to a store and actually talk to a human being. Just fire up Amazon, right? And just a couple clicks and the stuff will come to you. And it's coming faster and cheaper and more conveniently. You know, you don't need to come to church on Sunday. You can watch the whole sermon from your phone. You can pick the world's best speakers, right? And just from the comfort of your bed, you don't need to get out in traffic or in the rain or the snow, right? And, and, and you know, you don't actually have to go meet your friends. You can just go on Facebook or Instagram, right? <laughs> and you know what's ironic about all this? All these ways that technology is trying to make it easier and, and, and more, less vulnerable for you to connect is what we're finding is we have never been lonelier. We have never been lonelier. I could quote all the statistics all day long, which is true. They've done studies and they find that this generation that has grown up on social media is the loneliest generation. But you know it's true, don't you? Don't you? We need connection. We need to be with each other. This is what God has created you for. There's another in the fire. When you go through the worst things in life, this is the fundamental fact of the kingdom of God, is that you, you are not alone. You're not alone. You have a king who loves you. And so there's that line where it talks about the space between us. <laughs> the space between us. There's another in the fire, but where is Jesus standing? Is he like way over there? He's like, okay, I'll be here with you in the fire, but you're so sinful. You're so stinky. I'm going to stand over here. <laughs> but it says the space between us is shrinking. There is no separation. That's what it means here. So God is for you. Jesus is on your side. Jesus is putting his arm around you and saying, this is my dude. <laughs> this is my boy. This is my girl, right? This, this, is, this is my person. I love them. And so it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? There's no separation. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Brothers and sisters, we shared this last week. So if, if you want to hear about suffering and what the Christian view on suffering is, uh, go on our, our website and listen to last week's sermon. But brothers and sisters, this reiterates the point. This does not mean, the fact that God is on your side doesn't mean you won't suffer. It's very clear about this, right? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? The, the implication is that you could go through all of that. You could still go through tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. In fact, he's quoting a psalm that talks about people who are living for God, who are being killed for that. They're being slaughtered all the day long. And for Paul and many of the early Christians, this was just the reality for them. They knew to follow Christ meant you were choosing to be persecuted. He knew that. 
He celebrated that because he saw that as sharing in the life of Christ. And so he's like, bring it on. <laughs> You're going to persecute me? Well, you persecuted Jesus too. So thank you, Jesus, for counting me worthy enough to be persecuted. But this is the thing. He says, through all of that, there is nothing that will separate you. None of that stuff concerns Paul anymore. Even if he were to die, this is how close Jesus is to him, right? This is what Jesus' love is about. God's love for you is so close and so strong that even death itself will not separate you. So Paul's like, you want to kill me? Well, I get to be with Jesus. Great. <laughs> what can you do to me? What can you do to somebody who truly knows that and believes that? They're not afraid of anything, right? And so, brothers and sisters, uh, it goes on to say this. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So in all what things? Let's go back for a second. In tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, being murdered. In all these things, in all those things, we are more than conquerors. In the Greek, what it literally says is we are hooper nikomen. Hooper nikomen. What does that mean? Hooper nikomen. You see hyper, and then you see niko, which comes from the word nikao, which simply means victory. Right? Where do they get this from? In Greek, the, uh, the, there's a goddess of victory. Do you guys know what the name of the goddess of victory is? I bet you do. Nike. <laughs> That's where Nike got their name. It's the goddess of victory. They picked a symbol. They picked a name that they knew would mean victory. You're victorious, right? So, Hooper Nikomen, we are more than victorious. We more than conquer through him who loved us. Now, Nike is very clever in picking this because we like to be victorious, right? But this is the thing about Nike. What is their slogan? Just do it. <laughs> I think people have said that that is like the uh, most effective marketing um, slogan of all time or something like that. Just do it. Who are they talking about? They're talking about you as an individual. This appeals to us who live in this world that it's just you, right? Again, if you live in a world where there's no God at the bottom of it, there's no one to love you or support you, at the bottom of this world is nothing, then who do you have to re rely on? Who do you have to depend on? Yourself, that's it. So you just have to do it, right? So, so I, I know I talked about this a few weeks ago, but how many of us like group projects? We hate group projects, why? Because we don't want to depend on anyone else. So what is our slogan in group projects? You know what? I'll just do it. <laughs> I'll just do it. Right? Just do it is an individualistic uh, uh, plea to your ability to overcome. Right? So all the Nike commercials is some person sweating who's overcome insurmountable odds. You never seen a Nike commercial. I never seen a Nike commercial. A whole community supporting these people. Have you ever seen like, like a, a Hall of Fame quarterback? Uh, this happens sometimes. There's a Hall of Fame quarterback. They're like, this guy's the greatest football player in the history of the NFL. And they get to go to the Hall of Fame and all this stuff. You ever see a Hall of Fame quarterback get traded to another team and then they suck? Happens all the time. You know why? Because the reason why he was successful, the reason why he was victorious, was not because of himself. It's because there was other people there. He was in a system. He was in an environment that made him successful. This applies to everyone except for Tom Brady. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> not lying here. Uh, but brothers and sisters, the message that you always hear is, you have to conquer. So sometimes we read this passage as, oh, I, and it doesn't say I, does it? It says we. We are more than conquerors. All of us in Christ, right? I am a conqueror. And we just take that away. And we're like, okay, now I need to conquer any obstacle in my life. That's not what it says. It says, by the way, we are more than conquerors through him, through Christ. But it doesn't just stop at Christ. Through Christ who what? 
who has loved you. Through Christ who has loved you. This is how you are more than victorious. So, you know, I put up this Nike swoosh just so you, you would get the point that we're talking about victory here. But I was like, you know what? That Nike swoosh, it symbolizes just do it, myself, individual victory. So I thought, maybe I should put this, right? We are more than victorious. We are more than just individually victorious. And I was like, you know what? That's not doing it enough. (laughs) We are way more than victorious. Way more than victorious, brothers and sisters. You are way more effective. Your life is way better. (laughs) God can do way more than what you can do on your own. Through what? Through him who has loved you. It's not on your own. It's through living in a world where you are in Christ and this Christ has loved you, has died for you, has given everything for you. You live in a differently shaped universe. And if that's true, then in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. If this is true, then Paul can say, I am sure that neither death nor life, nothing that happens in this lifetime or after this lifetime, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, brothers and sisters, you are held There is nothing that can snatch you out of the hands of God. That's the world you live in. You are absolutely loved. You are absolutely supported. You absolutely have a God who is with you through the fires. And if you can believe this, then you live in a different kind of universe. I know for me, this has been a little bit hard as I've been going through my panic disorder. And so at the recommendation, uh, I, I think I told the story a few months ago, but Reverend Cho, the senior pastor of the other church, of the, the Korean church, of our, our mother church, um, I met with him when I, I couldn't sleep one night from my panic disorder. I would just jolt awake, and I couldn't sleep more than a few seconds. Sometimes, at most, I think I got like five minutes of sleep at a time. It was horrible. You know, I remember uh, Reverend Cho said, Steve, you know, they... Um, like not sleeping, like people use that as torture. I'm like, I know, thanks. Thanks for reminding me. But what he was doing, because as I was talking to him, I was panicking. You know, I, I'm, I'm just like, you know, Reverend Shaw, I don't know what to do. And to be honest, part of the reason why I met with him was I wanted permission to not go to church. So I was like, I don't think I can function. And he was like, Steve, I think the best place for you to be is in church. Why? Because he's like, in church is where you are going to hear this different kind of universe, this different kind of world. And then he started speaking these verses over me. He started reading Romans 8. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm sure that nothing can separate you. And for the, I, I, I've been going through this for the past three months. It's getting much better, much, much better. And one of the reasons why it's getting better is I'm coming to believe and ingest this truth more and more. And and for me, um, one of the things that came with my my panic disorder was just being afraid of everything. (laughs) Just like literally everything would make me afraid, you know? I, I got very obsessed with getting enough sun because I couldn't sleep. And I heard that, you know, there's this imbalance in Michigan and these other places where you don't get a lot of sun. So I was very obsessed with getting sun. I, you know, sort of like tell my wife in kind of a nice way, can you, can you not draw the blinds? I, I, I need more sun, right? And, 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 but sometimes, you know, going to bed, I'd be like, there's too much sun. I, I need, <laughs> you know, if I was trying to take a nap, you know, I'm like, oh, there's not enough sun. If there's too much sun, I, I was uh, anxious. If there wasn't enough sun, I was anxious. You know, I, I got very swirly about coffee. You know, I'd be very tired because I couldn't sleep, so I had to drink coffee. But then because I drank coffee, I couldn't go to bed. If I didn't have coffee, I'd be nervous. If I didn't, if I had coffee, I'd be nervous, right? If I ate, I'd be nervous. If I didn't eat, I would, would be nervous. If I exercised, I'd be nervous, if, right? Like everything was just making me anxious. That was the world I lived in. 
And one of the things that's happened as I've ingested these truths, as I've come to believe this, and, and to be honest, sometimes I would just read Romans 8, and I would read it over and over and over, and I'm shaking, and I'm panicking, and I feel like I can't breathe, and there's just a part of me that's like, Steve, can you just listen? I, I, don't, I don't know how to apply this, so I just kept reading it over and over and over again, and over, and over, and over again, until just somehow it just started to seep in a little bit. Brothers and sisters, this is what we want to live in this differently shaped universe. Um, I want to share with you what Dallas Willard said about this. These are two of his most famous quotes. We want to create the right environment for you to grow, for you to be safe, right, with God. And so Dallas Willard, probably two of his most famous quotes are two that are connected, right? Well, the first is, the present world is a perfectly safe place for us to be. He says sometimes the universe is a perfectly safe place for us to be. And Dallas Willard knew his church history. He knew that there were saints, many saints, who had been killed, murdered for their faith. And yet he would still say, the universe is a perfectly safe place for us to be. Why can Dallas Willard say that? Because of the first statement. We are unceasing spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. <laughs> Another way to put that is, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. So you're safe, you're loved, you're supported. This is the world that we live in. We live in now the right environment. Now, this is the question that I want to leave us with, is how? <laughs> how do you come into this? I will tell you how you don't come into this. Um, at least this won't get you all the way there. You can try this, but it probably won't work by just trying to clean up your life and trying to be really moral and trying to do all the right things so that somehow God will accept you now into his kingdom, that's precisely not how you get in. Because if that's how you got in, then the Pharisees would be first in line, right? They did that better than anybody. And Jesus said, sorry, <laughs> that's not how you get in. You know who's coming into the kingdom first? These tax collectors and these prostitutes, these poor people, these people who are doing it all wrong. Why? Because they realize the only way to get here is simply by receiving, by just walking through the door. You can only receive this, only receive this truth. And so if you want to live in this differently shaped universe, brothers and sisters, I, I, I know in many ways the things that we talk about, it is about sort of, uh, we think of it as doing something. But I want to encourage you to stop thinking of it as like this hard work that you have to do for God. But instead, to create spaces where you can welcome God in. So I talk sometimes about just being still, right? Because one of the, the lies that you have been told is that in order to be safe, in order to get what this world is promising you, you have to hustle, you have to move, you have to do stuff. And even Christianity becomes another thing to do, another thing to hustle. You gotta hustle for your worth. So we hate being still, right? And, and for some of us, it, f it feels like, like, like uh, this really painful thing to be still. It drives us crazy. But one of the things that I think being still does is, is, is it creates this place, this environment, where you cannot be under the illusion that God, when he's doing something for you, when you're being still, it's not because you did something, because you're not doing anything, right? If you start to calm down, it's not because you did something, right? If you start to get peace, it's not because you did something to get peace. You did nothing. You didn't deserve that peace. It's just given to you, right? It takes away the illusion that you have to hustle, that you have to strive to get what God wants to give to you. Just receive it. Um, something I want to encourage you to do, I know we talk about reading the Bible, but reading becomes a great chore for us today. Back in the day, reading is just how you got information, right? Like, like they didn't have churches where they could go to all the time and hear these messages. You know, they, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have, you know, uh, Spotify and all these things, right? 
you have all of these things. And if reading the Bible has become a great chore for you, I mean, I, first of all, I would encourage you to try, right? But to stop reading the Bible with like th this feeling of like either it's a great work, and so it's like, oh my gosh, this is so hard, like I don't want to do this. Or you read the Bible and you're like, this is hard, so good on me for reading the Bible. Oh my gosh, I'm so holy, right? So this is what I do when I'm feeling just like I can't do anything. Listen to some of these praise songs. Listen to Another in the Fire. We're going to sing a, a song that I used to listen to um, every night when I was going through my panic disorder, Living Hope. It's become a song that I can't listen to without tears anymore. That talks about the victory that we have in Jesus. The victory we have in Jesus. It's not me. So when I'm tired of fighting, when I'm like, Jesus, I'm just battered. I'm panicking and I, I, I just I feel unsafe. And I can just hear these words sung over me. Jesus Christ is our living hope. It's because of what Jesus has done for me that I can start coming to life. That, that it's not so much this great exertion of mental energy to believe this, but I just let this truth start to sink in <laughs> through osmosis. I just let it, just let it in. Just, just start to receive it. Surrender to that truth that Jesus is for you. He's on your side. Um, I want to go into this time of uh, uh, communion because this is what communion is about. It is about what Christ has done for you so you can be united to Christ forever. And so um, I'm going to ask the ushers to come up and, and I want to describe for you what this is all about. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, and this would begin the sequence of events that we are going to be commemorating and talking about in the next couple weeks as we get closer to Good Friday and Easter. Um, but Jesus um, shared one last meal. We're not exactly sure, but just based on the timing, we think it was Thursday. Um, and it was this day that Jesus shared this meal in the upper room with his disciples. And uh, many of these disciples, they would betray him. They would lose faith. They would lose hope. But with all of them, regardless of their moral behavior, regardless of their uh, felt faith in that moment, he broke bread with them. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you and for you and for you. I know, precious bread. Don't worry. We'll have enough. We'll have enough. God is enough. <laughs> And then in a similar way, towards uh, the end of the meal, we think, or in the middle of it, uh, he took a cup. And this would have been filled with wine. We have grape juice, but it would have probably looked about blood red. And he said that this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. This is a new way of doing things. Remember how you used to have to come up to God and had to achieve all these things and follow all these commandments and then you were righteous? No, I'm shedding my blood for you. I am the perfect sacrifice, so now you can come exactly as you are. This is the new covenant. And so, brothers and sisters, what we have done through the centuries, what Jesus has invited us to do, is reenact this meal, to receive it. And so, uh, I want to pray for these elements, and then we'll talk about how this is going to go down. Um, but pray for these elements, that they can become to us Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the bread and the cup. We pray that now they can become to us symbolically the body and blood of Jesus. Thank you for sending your son. There is no greater gift. This is the ultimate sign, God, that you are for us, not against us. Who can be against us? Who can accuse us? Who can tell us that we don't belong? There is nobody because you have spoken for all time. I am on their side. These people are with me. And it's something that you absolutely have done even when we didn't deserve it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. You are to be praised. And we want to receive this gift with joy. We want to receive this gift 
uh, with, with a heart that can create room for you to come in and say, yes, Lord, if you are this good, then we want you to be a part of our lives. We want to live in a differently shaped universe. Thank you, God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, in the United Methodist Church, uh, we practice open communion, which simply means that all are able to come. Uh, you don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be a church member for X amount of years to come to the table because we believe that what earns you the right to come to this table is simply what Christ has done. It's grace. So come and receive the grace. And if you want to come to the table, if you want to come up here, uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to take a, uh, you can take a piece of bread, rip it off, however big or small you want it to be. And I will say uh, something to the effect of this is the body of Christ broken for you. And you can take the bread, dip it in the cup, and that, that one of these two sisters will say to you, this is the blood of Christ shed for you or something like that. And take it, receive it. You can say thanks be to God. You can say nothing at all. You can say amen. Just receive it. Taste the sweetness of the bread. Be here in this moment. Don't overthink it. Just receive what God is giving to you, joining you to him, and just receive that in joy. And so um, if you could do the same for me. Thanks be to God. Jimin, the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. So please come as, as you are uh, able and willing. And so come, you know, through the center. Um, if you can take the bread one at a time, but whatever side you're sitting on, if you could just come and go to that side and then go back around to your seat. So please come as you are ready. Haram, the body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you, young. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Jim. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, John. The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you, John. The body of Christ broken for you, Ashley. The body of Christ broken for you, Abby and Thomas. The body of Christ broken for you, Sonny and Philip. The body of Christ broken for you, Josh. The body of Christ broken for you, Elaine. The body of Christ broken for you, Judy. Esther, the body of Christ broken for you. Adi, the body of Christ broken for you. Hannah, the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, Sammy. The body of Christ broken for you, Mike. The body of Christ broken for you, Amy. The body of Christ broken for you, Angelina. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you. 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 The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you, brother. The body of Christ broken for you. 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 
them back. The body of Christ is broken for you. 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 Did Jimmy? The body of Christ is broken for you. Can, can you put this back for me? Thank you. All right, let us pray. God, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, God. More than what we could ever do, Lord. More than we could ever earn. God, what an awesome gift. I know it flies in the face of our world and our culture of achievement. God, to just say that the ultimate achievement that we could ever have is something that we did not do, but something done in us, something we just receive with open hands and open hearts. So God, as we continue to sing of your greatness, of this gospel truth, of this good news, that we can just receive it, God, in faith and trust, knowing it has been done, and we are included in this great promise. We can live in a differently shaped universe because of what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.